Thank you, Smitty, for that very detailed introduction. I appreciate it. it, makes me feel important. All right, hi everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Mary Meisel, and this evening I'll be discussing my master's thesis research done at Gamble Plantation for the zooarchaeological analysis of the kitchen midden. So before I dive too deeply into my actual research project, I just want to give a brief overview of what zooarchaeology actually is and how it functions. Um, so in short, zooarchaeology is the study of animal remains that have been excavated from an archaeological context, very simply put. Um, by examining skeletal remains of mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fishes, so archaeologists can piece together the food ways of past peoples. So food ways is that umbrella that we'll be coming back to throughout the discussion. Is there a way you can move your... Uh, Ooh, I don't know. I don't know. That's better. That is better. <laughs> I thought that was just on my screen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the technical applause. Okay. There it goes. Now we're back. All right. So food waste is not just a discussion of what calories and proteins are being consumed, but is, again, that umbrella under which cuisine and culture come together. So through the lens of food waste, food is not just fuel for the body that we all need to eat every day to survive, but it's really fuel for life for our social and cultural endeavors. Cooking techniques, spices, tools, serving rituals, the physical environment that food is prepared in, and so much more are all a part of these cultural traditions that inform our individual understandings of food ways. So each person's individual understanding of food and its preparation and its meaning. So my research specifically examines the faunal remains recovered from Gamble Plantation to offer a very small snapshot of non-native foodways on the Florida frontier. So Gamble Plantation, as I'm sure many of you are familiar, sits on the banks of the Manatee River in Ellington, Florida, which is about 20 miles north of where we are right now. Um, you can see I-275, I-75, here is the Manatee River. Um, we are farther south off the map currently. Um, but Gamble Plantation sits about a mile from the Manatee River waterline. So that little space is just about a mile as the crow would fly. So to begin, a bit of background um, before we dive too, too deeply into the bones of things. Um, human occupation began on the Gulf Coast of Florida about 5000 BCE. And we're going to take a very long leap forward in time to Spanish conquistadors beginning to explore and exploit the area in the 1500s, that mid 1500s range. So pictured here is the infamous Hernando de Soto. Um, and we're going to take another smaller jump forward in time now. Um, to 1816 timeframe, the Seminole Wars begins. And then during this time, the territory of Florida is annexed by the United States in 1822. Um, sorry, I lost my place for a second. Uh, the frontier of Florida is thrown wide open at this point um, with the passing of the Armed Occupation Act 20 years later in 1842. So it was through this act that the federal government granted 160 acres of land to any white male over the age of 18 who could bear arms and agreed to live and farm on a minimum of their five, on a minimum of five of the 160 acres they were allotted in that agreement for a minimum of five years. So you're 18, you can get 160 acres of land in Florida. You don't know what it is. You don't know what you're coming down to. You have to agree to make a minimum of five acres of it agriculturally sound for a minimum of five years. So for people who don't know what they're getting into, that's a very large task. So Robert Gamble, 
comes down to Florida from, comes down to South Florida from Tallahassee, where he's residing at the time, to the Manatee River in 1844. Now, this is following his service in the second wave of the Seminole War, about 1836 to 1842. He arrived and independently purchased the land that Gamble Plantation was, and some of which is still today. Um, and we brought with him 10 enslaved men who quickly broke ground on the mansion clearing the land, et cetera. So during his occupation, Gamble had 16 miles of canal stock. Vast swaths of land were cleared and a sugar mill built under the guidance of local artisans. So by 1850, he had amassed 70 enslaved individuals reported on the property. And then just five years later in 1855, it was reported that 151 enslaved individuals were living and working on the property. So this is the height of the sugar mill production. So, sorry, that was upside down. So Gamble is not able to maintain his ownership of the plantation. Sugar cane kind of falls off a little bit. There's several hurricanes. There's a fire. He just can't keep up with this much land and this much home as a bachelor. Um, so in 1856, he sells to the partnership of Cofield and Davis, and they were a brokerage firm from Louisiana. So similar swampy frontier kind of environment. Um, during the Civil War, the Confederacy takes possession, and in 1862, Confederacy basically was just like, hey, we're going to take this from you, and we're going to run cattle through here, um, which is very common for the time, which we can get into a little more later. But in 1873, the Patton family era begins, and the Patton family era continues for a very long time, and a bit, if you want to think about it that way, into today. Their presence is the longest lasting presence at Gamble Plantation. So in 1920, after the mansion has deteriorated, it was used as an informal boarding house, it's sold to the Armory Fertilizer Works as a warehouse. And then just seven years later, the United Daughters of the Confederacy take control and their ownership was stipulated to include that the state of Florida would designate this building as a property for a historic state park, which it is today. They upheld that. Um, and today we know it as the Judah P. Benjamin Confederate Memorial at Gamble Plantation Historic State Park, which is a mouthful of a name. And as we'll get into, a bit of a misnomer. So. We have our general area history. Now into the archeological background. Archeological investigation at Gamble Plantation began in 2017 under the direction of Dr. Diane Wallman um, and continued through the end of the 2018 field season. So for two summers, there were students and volunteers excavating at the back of the mansion in the kitchen area. Um, and you might notice a familiar face in this photo, uh, but one of our very own Soretta is right here. Soretta was a volunteer on the project. <laughs> yes, it is in her Time Sifters beautiful shirt. <laughs> so just a little shout out to Soretta. Thank you very much. Um, and then the actual archaeology focused on the rear of the mansion here, this whole area, like where those palm tree is and over. Um, so I have created a digital rendering for you to show some of the excavation areas. Um, so Locust Shady Oak, this first one, uh, was placed directly behind the kitchen. And then Locust North Palm, very aptly named, uh, focused on the north of the palm tree. Um, and it's within this specific locus that the privy feature was found. And the material recovered during these excavations, both seasons, spans the entire occupation of the estate. So from 1844, when Gamble had his laborers break down, break ground, um, all the way through the mid-1920s when it was an informal boarding house. 
So gamble. Oh, that's wrong. Um, so my research questions specifically are: What was eaten and how was it prepared? What can these foodways and choices tell us about life on the Florida frontier? And then what was the role of meat and meat consumption within the social relations at the site over time? I'm really basically interested in what people were eating, how were they eating it, who was cooking it, and what can that tell us more about the intricacies of their daily lives? So some of the methods that I have used, um, they're pretty straightforward. Each faunal specimen recovered during the excavations has been individually analyzed through element, species, and taphonomy, including cultural and environmental. And we're going to go into each one of those as we move forward. Um, all specimens were identified down to the lowest taxonomic level possible, um, as well as being identified by the portion, which is the element. Um, and then they were all recorded and the analysis was based off of the comparative collection and then other our, uh, zooarchaeological publications and guides. Um, these are your three, three most known and notable zooarchaeological texts. Um, any zooarchaeological research you read will most definitely uh, have those in it. So pictured here, right here, is this lovely wall of skulls, which my skull is currently in the way of. <laughs> so I'm going to move myself over here. Um, and this is one of the walls in the historical archaeology laboratory at University of South Florida. So I would look up at these and say, what is this small piece of something? And they would stare back at me and go, why are you talking to us, you weird child? <laughs> <laughs> so that is how I did my research. And you can see here some of my little setup. We would measure, weigh take any kind of notes on everything. All of that went into an electronic database that I kept, and then I was able to synthesize that data into the results that I have coming up next. So, some of our results firstly feature on domestic species. Let me make myself over here. So of the species examined um, in this particular sample are a majority of cow, pig, and chicken, which is expected for the time period. I'm not surprised by this finding. Um, so domestic species like this provide more than just calories. So we would go to the grocery store today, purchase cuts of these animals and say, oh, this is going to be a delicious dinner. That's not all these animals can do for people. Um, so first looking at cattle, Florida has had a well-established cattle industry since 1861 at minimum, um, probably much earlier than that. The first cattle were introduced with that Spanish exploration um, in the mid-1500s. And so, but in the 1860s specifically, cattle took over Florida economy because they outbeat sugar in cash crop value. So cattle provide meat as well as milk and dairy products for consumption. They also provide brute strength in labor and fertilizer to help your other crops flourish. Another species that can provide fertilizer are chickens. They also provide soil aeration, pest control for insects and small vermin, and then in addition to their meat and their eggs. And these chickens here, there's a little white one, a gray one, and a black one. Um, these are actually out front of Gamble Plantation, probably in the 1920s. Um, so there was a flock of chickens living there for a very substantial amount of time. Um, and then we can move on to some of the wild results because domestic species were not the only species being consumed. So, this is really what I was hoping to find in this analysis. I wanted to see how they're interacting with the environment and using it to their advantage, disadvantage, et cetera. So among the wild species are bobwhite quail, several species of turtles and tortoises, many fishes, several alligators and ubiquitous gray squirrel, wild hogs, which 
were differentiated from domesticated pigs, et cetera. So we had one example of stone, claw, stone crab claws and possums. So they're really taking advantage of everything that's available. So how can we tell which of these animals were eaten? And one distinct feature that I look for is evidence of butchery. So the image here shows an example of a cow hip with primary butchery. So from the domesticated cows and pig specimens examined so far, um, I've been able to determine that both primary and secondary butchery were taking place or as part of food preparation and the economic enterprises at Gamble Plantation. So that is, are they preparing the cow for their own consumption or for sale? Is someone buying a half of a cow or half of a hog or are they only buying, let's say, oh, I want a shoulder cut. Oh, I want a rump roast. Oh, I only want a sirloin. So your primary is that initial deceasement and having, and then you get your secondary cuts, which are more closely related to what we would buy in a store today, even though what we have today is, again, much more condensed and specialized. Um, so for pigs, we have shoat and trotters found specifically. A shoat would be a whole suckling pig or a piglet. Um, and the trotters are the pig's feet, which were a very sought after cut during this time. So in the same context as this portion of cow, um, we also found a portion of a soft shell turtle. This is the part of the breastplate of the carapace of a soft shell turtle that does have evidence of butchery. This line here is not natural. When I looked at it very closely under an electronic microscope, you can see some of the saw incisions um, and gradient change there, which is very interesting to see. Um, I wish I could have brought it in to pass around and show you all. Um, but we also have a chicken vertebra and an alligator tooth. And all of these were found in the same unit at the same level. So they were brought to me in the same specimen bag, just showing you just to illustrate how mixed this context really was. Um, and I, from this visual analysis, I cannot say whether this alligator was eaten or whether it was hunted, but seeing it in this context with two other butchered remains and the remains of a chicken vertebra, I'm comfortable to suppose that it was consumed. So let's move on to another area of evidence, which is ceramics. So as I mentioned back in the beginning of our discussion, food waste is not just calories and consumption. What people eat on and with is also really important to the equation of figuring out how people are relating to their food. Are you eating it on your fancy china or are you eating it on your everyday dishes? Um, so pictured here are four examples of ceramic shirts recovered from the excavations at Gamble. Um, this first image here shows a shell-edged blue shirt, which dates from about 1660 to 1800. Um, the second the second and third images, these are two different shirts from the same pattern. So I cannot say whether they were actually the same vessel. Are they a cup, a plate, a bowl, a saucer, a serving dish? Cannot say, but the patterns are the same. Um, so because of that, because of the floral and geometric motif and that they are a medium blue transfer print color, we can deduce <laughs> that their range of production was 1784 to 1859. Um, and then finally, we have this rather plain looking piece here. Um, it is just a plain shirt of whiteware that probably came from a plate or the bottom of a bowl or something. It's very flat, um, not too thin, but thin enough. The interesting thing about this shirt is that it has a bit of a maker's mark on it. So it has the word royal very faintly in all capital letters in an arc 
over what myself and some colleagues have determined to be a lion's head. So this is a very common combination of text and image that would be found in English pottery, English ceramic studios. But because it has that commonality and I don't have the words that come after it or the rest of the image underneath of it, I can't say exactly when or where it came from. So even though I'm that much closer to an identification on this one than I am from these, I still can't get there. But if anyone has any ideas, they've seen something similar, let me know. I'm very open to collaboration. So just to plant the seed there. All right, but ceramics, funnels, they go together. You wouldn't necessarily think so visually, but theoretically they do. So how can ceramics help me identify food though? They're very different. The variability of the ceramics and the funnels together is how I can create tables such as this um, that show time across Gamble occupation. So this chart shows the mean ceramic dates identified within the level of excavation that they were recovered from in the Gamble Plantation excavations of both 2017 and 2018. Um, so let's focus on this first set of dates here. So these three dates we're going to focus on together individually. And then the privy, this last one here, is going to be a separate portion of the discussion uh, because it is a very distinct and unique feature in and of itself. So levels eight, seven, and six here. So where the box is corresponds with the levels. Um, had a very diverse array of faunals present. It included cattle, pig, goat, chicken, dove, squirrel, pond turtles, like your slider turtles and your box turtles, um, as well as several fishes, cat, mullet, drum, a jack even, which was most likely a creval jack, which you could at that time could have been caught just offshore in the bay or even up into the Manatee River. So they had access to a greater diversity of fish and terrestrial life than we would have now. Um, whereas now we have to go several miles offshore to be able to catch a creval jack in 1858, they did not need to go that far. Um, so moving on to this next set of dates, which is higher up in the excavation, we have slightly less diversity, um, mostly unidentifiable small, medium, and large mammals, which just means that the bones didn't have a distinct feature that I could peg them with for one animal over another, or they were just too friable and too fragile. Um, but in this kind of mid-tier range, my pointer died, I'm sorry. Um, we have cattle, pig, and the, that Florida softshell turtle that I showed you earlier. Um, and then going to the highest levels of excavation, so levels one, two, and three, so closest to your modern ground surface now. Um, we had slightly more diversity than levels four and five um, with all the same things, but with the addition of coyote, which is interesting. Um, I don't really imagine, well, I can't say that. I've never had one, so I don't imagine how a coyote tastes. Um, but what we do know is that the privy, a very unique feature in and of itself, which re was required to be analyzed completely outside of the rest of these. Um, so we really wanted to kind of hold on to that microcosm that's happening there. Um, so privies are always wonderful to find in an archeological context because usually with that wood lining that they would have, they hold so much specific context and can be used for the disposal of so many different objects. It is not just personal waste that would go into a privy. It is food remains, it's bottles, it's ceramics, it's anything that's broken. It's anything that you would want to hide and not have in your regular trash. 
Um, because these middens were not always covered over with dirt every day. You know, you'd grow a layer of midden and then cover it with dirt. You'd grow another layer and then cover it. But privies, it falls down that hole, no one's going after it. So you do get that little level of amenity with it. Um, so in this feature, we were able to determine so far, because there is more from this feature that needs to be done, um, that there are cattle, pig, chicken, squirrel, turkey, northern bob white quail, sheep, white-tailed deer, Florida soft-shelled turtles, snapping turtles. So we're getting bigger turtles than we had in this first level here. So there were smaller turtles and then larger turtles over in the privy along with a lot of unidentifiable mammals, birds, fishes, um, but the, also the single stone crab claw that was identified also came from the privy. So why is it important to talk about food remains? Some of these remains, like that of the northern bobwhite quail and the turkey, can serve as evidence for social Practices, hunting was a social activity as well as it was a subsistence activity. So if you have your cost on yield ratio, a quail is not going to give you as much yield for the time cost it takes and the material cost that goes into actually acquiring a single quail. And a single quail might be enough to sustain one person for a single meal. However, that same cost yield on a turkey is much greater. You can serve a wider number of people in more substantial amount with a turkey, and it also does not take as much material cost as would go into quail hunting. So we can assume, because of that kind of train of thought, as well as historical data, that quail were hunted for sport and turkey were hunted for sport, but as well as subsistence. So not to say you're not eating your prized quail after you bring it home, but that active sport um, is more so why that's reflected in this context. Yep. Sorry. Um, so one of the most valuable pieces of evidence that I was able to work with during my research project process was an oral history from Ida Mel Patent, uh, who was the daughter of Dudley Patent. So that last kind of formal era of occupation at Gamble. So during her life there, Ida Mel's father Dudley built the Patent House, which is still on location at the park, and they expanded it and et cetera. So she has a wealth of knowledge, and some of which she shared also included food. And so in that account of her childhood, she notes making clabber, which is this cottage cheese, sour cream, yogurt equivalent, um, an easy cheese to make at home, in that she notes that Two of her brothers would kind of fight over who had the chore of milking the cow because one enjoyed it and one absolutely did not. Um, unfortunately, the one who absolutely did not was the older brother, and so he would force the younger one to do it. Um, but she also talks about collecting, peeling, and eating oranges with her siblings and friends. And it's interesting to read this account because it not only illustrates the food ways at Gamble during the Victorian era, but it also illustrates the social experience related to food. Milking a cow, making clabber, collecting and peeling oranges is fun and games. It's a pastime. She called it their recreation for children in the Victorian era. Wealthy white children in the Victorian era. Had, this, had these tasks been given to someone else, a non-white elite child of the Victorian era, they would have been work and labor and seen as chores. So it just goes to show you those greater disparities that kind of underlie all of this work. But that's it for a second. And then in addition to the research questions that I've been asking about food, I've also been looking at Gamble more broadly in the representation that they put out to the public now. So 
Today, Gamble Plantation, known once again as the Judah P. Benjamin Confederate Memorial at Gamble Plantation. So in this image here, you can see the backside of the mansion. Um, and if you are facing the mansion from the front, you're looking at kind of that left side, so opposite the cistern. Um, Gamble Plantation in its original configuration, can you see that? Yes. Did not have this section of wall and supports. That is a later addition, not part of the original architectural design. Um, so this, where this lower window would be looking into the kitchen and there's an identical one on the other side that would be looking into the laundry. Those two rooms most likely at some point in time, maybe not, were connected um, and would have shared some kind of access to fire because you need fire for both cooking and for the heating of water for laundry. Um, so on top of the kitchen and the laundry would have been two living quarters. Now these, this section of building was separate from the main house. So this wall is obstructing the view of what we might today think of as a breezeway in the South. Um, but these nearly two identical rooms are not presented as what historical record should have them presented as, as, in addition to the evidence that we're finding. So today, the interpretations at Gamble Plantation give visitors kind of a, a whitewashed view of what was going on. Um, this wall functions to physically and metaphorically obscure the visitor's view of what has been called by some authors as a whistle walk. Um, I use air quotes because not everyone agrees with that terminology for it, but I feel it's it's very illustrative. Um, so the idea is that this physical wall deters you as a visitor from realizing and understanding the racialized realities of food and food relationships in a plantation context, um, that during meal services, enslaved individuals were required to whistle from the kitchen to the dining room or have some kind of audible noise or pattern that was auditory proof to those they were going to serve that they were not eating any of the food along the way. You cannot whistle with a full mouth. This is a very debated point right now in historical literature and historical archaeology. I point it out mainly to show some of the disparities that are happening in the presentation at Gamble currently. So another disparity happening at Gamble is that outside of the kitchen, as you go towards the northern end of the property, is the Gamble Commemorative Garden. Robert Gamble didn't do any of the gardening himself. He upheld these Southern genteel images and values and had many enslaved laborers at his disposal. There are letters and records that illustrate this. And I think calling the Gamble commemorative garden after him is a bit insulting, actually, to the real people who were using and working and a part of this physical landscape, this Florida frontier area. And as you can see in these two images, the presentation inside of the kitchen is also dated. It has not changed at least from the 1960s to today. And I have been also in 2023 and it looks the same as it did in 2022. This is the same hearth, the same some of the same actual props. Um, and it is, again, a white park ranger who works for the state of Florida telling a vast majority of white visitors about how it would have been so nice to have your kitchen detached because it saved you from fire, but also that you could just sit in your dining room or your lounge and enjoy someone bringing you their coffee. And wouldn't that be nice? We wouldn't all have to do it for ourselves. So. It's complicated, but I believe that there can be progress made. Um, and I hope to be part of that solution with this research. So we'll see what happens.
Um, because in this way, I feel that the influence of the information and updated interpretations could grow this into something that actually does tell a very truthful interpretation of Florida frontier history. Um, I would also like to suggest that the name be changed, um, but that probably will take a much longer battle. Um, so to at least begin by including the enslaved men and women in the interpretations and acknowledging their presence, I think that's the first step forward. So I appreciate you all for being here and for listening. Um, if you are interested, these are some very wonderful texts and documentaries on Netflix and in recent publication um, that go into more of these ideas as a whole. So for the entirety of the Southern region of the United States, um, but then also more Florida specifically as well. So if anyone has any questions,